It's my uh, pleasure to welcome you to the 2012 Cubby Lecture Series. We have quite an exciting lineup uh, this week, and we're starting off this week with my uh, dear friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Carl Kaiser. Um, Carl, as most of you probably know, was the co-founder and winemaker at Inniskillen Wines uh, for many, many years. He's now a consultant uh, for the industry and also uh, we're very lucky to have Carl as part of our Cubby team as one of our Cubby professional affiliates. Uh, just for a little bit of background on Carl, because it's quite an interesting story, uh, Carl has quite a connection to us here at Brock University. He earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry uh, back in 1974, uh, sorry to date you a little bit there, uh, and then was also uh, uh, granted an honorary doctorate uh, from uh, Brock University in 1994. Uh, Carl started uh, uh, in his interest in enology and viticulture back uh, in his homeland of Austria, uh, where he started to uh, learn the, the art of winemaking uh, at a monastery. He spent a little bit of time as a, a school teacher, uh, and during his spare time actually worked in the cellars of a small wine operation uh, in Austria. In 1969, he immigrated here to Canada, returned to school, and that's when he uh, received his Bachelor of Science degree here at Brock University. He was appointed uh, through the years uh, um, at Inniskillen and Vincor, eventually uh, was appointed as National Vice President, Quality and Science, uh, for Vincor International, and then uh, eventually retired a few years ago in 2006. Uh, Carl's always had a very active interest in research and teaching, and uh, we've uh, had a very strong uh, collaboration with Carl over the years. He uh, was the, the first instructor of our wine chemistry course in our enology and viticulture program. Uh, and uh, actually came back a couple of years uh, ago to teach the course on my behalf when I uh, took on the, the role of, of Cubby Director. Uh, Carl's also received uh, the Ontario Wine Society's first Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, in 1993, he received the Order of Ontario, and in 2002, he was presented with the Golden Jubilee Award, which recognized the 50th anniversary of the Queen's coronation. I've had the pleasure to continue my collaboration uh, with Carl over the years on ice wine research, uh, but today he's actually going to share his expertise on another important aspect of uh, wine production, and that's deacidification. Of course, for us being in a cool climate uh, region, sometimes we have the odd year where our acid levels get to be a little bit high, and Carl's going to share his expertise in that area on how best to manage uh, those situations. So, Carl, you, uh, you're very welcome. <coughs> um, I only have one hour, and they're going to be very strict with me, so we have to quickly work it through. Um, acidifications in winemaking, acidification, deacidification, both of those things are happening quite frequently. Um, acidifications are more common for warmer climates, deacidifications are more common in cooler climate, uh, higher, higher latitudes or colder years. Uh, and we do that in order to balance the grape juice for winemaking or if you wait till after fermentation, then again it's the same reason to balance the wine and for the chemical health and stability of the wine. The chemicals used in the food industry, which increase the, the acid or decrease their pH, are called acidulants. But this term is actually much broader because it's not necessarily um, for chemical balance or stability, it's also for taste. And inorganic acidulants are phosphoric acid, for example. Acetylens in winemaking, this is one where you might not be aware of, it's legalized and I have taken the Food and Drug Act from the last week of November, the Food and Drug Regulation for Wine, so everything you see here is totally up to date, what is legal and what is not legal. If it's not legal, it's going to be pointed out. Um, so the calcium sulfate is used um, in for sherry in Spain, 
and it's sometimes called plastering. Calcium sulfate is basically plaster. If it's hydrated, if it's hydrated, it's plaster. And so, if you add calcium sulfate to tartaric acid, then you get calcium tartrate precipitation, and which drops out. And the H plus is going to acidify the wine, dropping the pH. And that's very important in, for sherry in Spain because the grapes are from warm climate and can have very high pHs. Um, citric acid is used in winemaking. It's normally not recommended before fermentation because it's not stable. Malolactic bacteria can attack it and can uh, produce the acetyl, which is buttery, sort of, and vinegar, acetic acid. But it is used as up to one gram per liter sometimes in the dosage and sparkling wine making to prevent metal haze, acetic uh, acid, real, real complex metal ions. Uh, in Canada, it's called anything in Canada where there's no limit. It's called GMP, Good Manufacturing Practices. The, law, the regulator leaves it up to you that you're reasonable with it. Uh, fumaric acid is also used in winemaking, but it's really only there to um, in inhibit malolactic fermentation. That was never legal in Europe, uh, and it was the Americans, particularly Robert Mondavi, who uh, tried to, uh, who pushed that in the United States to have it uh, legalized. And then, of course, we came after and said, if the Americans can have it, we want to have it too. So that's why we have it. Um, uh, lactic acid <clears throat> is a very mild acid. It's a byproduct of our lactic fermentation, but it also is legal to be added. It's a mild, uh, increases mildly the acid taste, and it's also used in a lot of food, pro uh, food products as a sizzler because of its property being a mild acid. Mm. And pure lactic acid is really flavorless. It doesn't have um, flavor of diacetyl or anything. This is only a byproduct from mild lactic fermentation. Um, malic acid, what you can buy commercially, is a racemic product, that means, because malic acid has uh, asymmetric carbon atom, for, for anybody who is a chemist will understand, <clears throat> if a carbon atom has four different side groups, then it can cause two isomers. If this is dissolved in water and you put polarized light through, it can turn the light right or left, depending on which isomer it is. Uh, there's no limit in Canada. It's it's up to you what taste you have and what balance you want to have. <coughs> the tartaric acid <coughs> is probably the most widely used acid in winemaking, not only in Canada and but throughout the world, particularly in warm climates. They need tons of tartaric acid to <coughs> make up for natural deficiency. Um, and uh, what you have is tartaric acid being added here. It, dis it dissociates, dissociates into HT minus, the bitartrate ion, plus hydrogen, which is a, a proton, which uh, of course will also lower the pH, and then it eventually will dissociate in the double minus, and that's the second ionization constant, or dissociation constant. Uh, here we have a table, uh, the acids which are, can be used in winemaking. Um, tartaric acid, and here the molecular weight, and here you have the dissociation constant, uh, or sometimes it's called ionization constant. And tartaric acid is uh, um, um, probably the strongest acid here on the table because uh, it has the highest dissociation, the first uh, KD1, KD2, and then the PK is the acid constant. Um, 
De deacidification of wine generally means reduction in titrable acidity, which we call from now on TA. Um, sometimes it's called, in olden textbook, and the way I learned it, we called it total acid, but it's basically the titrable acidity to be chemically speaking correct uh, in the language. Uh, the acid reduction are more common in northern climate, of course, and or cooler growing seasons. Some acid reduction are often done systematically on certain wines, and for example, malolactic fermentation on red wines, but that's not a chemical desertification, that's of course a bacterial desertification. Uh, Amelioration's is a broad name, both for acidification and desertification. And both of them are sometimes called ameliorations, meaning to make it better, to improve upon, to make more tolerable, to amend, to enhance, to enrich, to help ameliorate, to perfect, to refine, and to upgrade. However, in the mind of most winemakers, amelioration means the use of water. That's not a common understanding for winemaker, winemaker's language, that if you add water, Dilute it, dilute the grape juice, um, and the excuse was, of course, to improve the wine. Uh, we know the addition of water is more meant for cost savings, so uh, to get cheap, cheap liquid. But uh, since amelioration has become a euphemism for water stretching, the methods of, of desertification, amelioration, meaning watering, stretching with water, <coughs> fermentation with blending, um, fermentation with acid reducing yeast is another means of reducing the acid, malolactic fermentation is for, as, we, as I mentioned, pretty much for reds everywhere in the world, chemical desertification, and this is what we're going to uh, discuss in a, in a minute. So amelioration is the addition of water to juice stretching. It will dilute the acid, but it generally does not reduce the pH. So you cannot, uh, we have it on the bottom, it is prohibited for table wine anyway, but if you use water, it would not change the pH of the wine, but it increases the volume and uh, it dilutes the acidity. Um, commonly used uh, to produce 7% alcohol wines. And I shouldn't mention it, but uh, whatever, we have a number of them in Ontario, uh, which are quite common, 7% uh, sparkling wines and so on. Uh, blending. Uh, in this context, what I'm talking here for a second is not for flavor. Uh, it's not, it's not, this is for desertification. It's for flavor, it's a different purpose. If you add Gewürztraminer into Riesling, which you maybe shouldn't, but uh, then you would blend for flavor if you do that. Um, but uh, blending is, yeah, you, you might blend a, a, a Riesling from from one grower or for one thing for high acid and another for low acid so you get a balance uh, or for pH. But it is limited by the mass availability you choose. Then it is limited by the Appalachian rules. For example, um, you can only put, let's say, 15% from Lake Erie in Orchard into Niagara, Niagara Peninsula, so you're limited. In Europe, they have the same thing. A Burgundy guy cannot blend a Bordeaux into it. Um, and then it's also the varietal content rule. So VQA is like 85%, 15% for single variety. So you're limited on that. Vintage content rules, you can only blend in 15% for another vintage. Or together, a known vintage, from non, from not from the same vintage, to get a 15% from one or two years before together. Uh, now we come to the acidification, um, fermentation with acid-reducing yeast. And this used to be 
uh, it's pretty much every wine, every wine we use to Saccharomyces strain does um, ferment small amount of malic acid. Some of them are said to do more. And in the booklets from the suppliers, let's say from Lalamau or from La Foua, uh, which is sold to some other agent, and some agent, it would say, for example, 71B is a high malic acid reducing yeast. Um, I talked with somebody yesterday, he said I haven't seen it, but nevertheless, some yeast do reduce the malic acid to, um, to more so than others. But generally speaking, it's never more than like uh, 10 to 20 percent at the most. Uh, then, then the age of citrus saccharomyces pombay means the splitting yeast. If you're schizophrenic, you have a split mind. And because this yeast uh, uh, propagates or divides, um, does not grow by budding, like Saccharomyces cerevisiae does, it multiplies by splitting it half, and that's why it's called schizosaccharomyces, it multiplies by splitting. It was first observed in African millet, millet beer, and Pombe or Pom means B in Swahili language. And first they had grow great, it was first discovered in 1893. It, they thought, it, this wow, this is great, we have a yeast now which gets rid of the malic acid or reduces it. But they found out <coughs> eventually there was a, from the first great expectation were great disappointments because the yeast did not deliver prop a lot of good things at regular fermentation temperature which would be anywhere from let's say 15 to 30 degrees Celsius, 32. This yeast needs a very high temperature to, to grow and so from that point of view it's not competitive with the Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Secondly, it produces uh, by uh, off flavors. However, um, in two weeks from now, Dr. Kutsuridi, who does work here from Kobe, uh, they're working on some new things that the yeast may be capsule, but um, I don't know too much about it, but David asked me to put that in. So there is new, renewed interest in that yeast. Model active fermentation, as you all know, for it, it reduces malic acid to lactic acid. Now, malic acid is a dicarboxylic acid, and lactic acid is a, a mono monocarboxylic acid. So, lactic acid is a much uh, less acidic yeast, and through the bacteria, the carbon dioxide is split off from the malic acid from one end of the molecule. Uh, and it reduces the acidity. Of course, this is just a number because it depends on the initial concentration uh, between one and three grams per liter. And it changes the taste. Malic acid, the term word comes from malum, which in la Latin means the apple. So the malic acid is the apple acid. It's a uh, taste different than the ceric acid. But overall, the malolactic fermentation will lower the, the TA and it will increase the pH. And anybody who has done a malolactic fermentation on red or on Chardonnay will have experienced that. Then uh, this is a process which is definitely not used by small wineries and even large wineries. I'm not really using it that much anymore. That you c would use a weekly anion resin exchange and what it does the resins have hydrogen ions uh, hydroxy ions attached to the resin and when the, the wine um, are pumped through it's pumped through it grabs the OH and exchanges it for some negative ions from the wine so that's why it neutralizes the OH groups, neutralizes the OH, neutralizes the H plus from the acidity, and therefore increase the pH and decrease the, the tidal acidity. That used to be, those things were maybe used 
uh, in the States, maybe for Canandaiga, maybe 40 years ago at Bright's, I'm not sure. Or the, basically at large commercial wineries who had to set up for iron exchange. Uh, today, I, plus it's very detrimental to the wine because by pulling off a lot of irons, from wine irons, uh, like from amino acids and so on, it really strips the wine. Um, chemical desification, now we come to more realistic things. Potassium tartrate is uh, basically um, stronger, has more potassium available than potassium pytartrate, and we'll come to a second. But you can precipitate with one molecule of potassium tartrate, two molecules of the teric acid, which it would be fall, falling away, uh, potassium tartrate plus the teric acid gives two potassium by tartrate and eventually they will precipitate a cream of tartar. You need less because two moles of potassium tartar will produce, will, the one mole of potassium tartar will reduce two moles of the teric acid. But I don't know any winery who is using it. It's legal and if for some reason someday you couldn't get potassium by production by carbonate, then you would uh, um, go for that. Again, it does it, it lowers the uh, acid and uh, increases the pH. GMP, there's no limit. It's up to your judgment. Um, so carbonate desification, um, sorry, I have to go back. Potassium tartrate, so it's potassium tartrate and not carbonate. I say one time carbonate. It's not used really. And now we have the carbonate desification. And if one is the calcium carbonate, um, under the present food and drug act, we have three carbonates permitted calcium carbonate, which is precipitated chalk. Um, uh, but we just call it calcium carbonate, has a molecular weight of 100 uh, grams per mole. And there's two techniques to use it, the simple salt and the double salt. Simple salt is for minor desification and, and it reacts, um, it, it uh, will come to that in a second, and you use as much as with the potassium bicarbonate to precipitate one gram of tartaric acid. And now we have the potassium carbonate, which has two potassium ions, and it does the double. So basic carbonate reaction with acids give water and carbon dioxide. So you add them to the wine, you see foaming, but it depends how much you add. If you only add a little bit, it makes the wine a bit gassy, but it won't foam. But if you add a, a lot, if you need a lot, yes, you'll really see the carbon dioxide um, coming out there. And here's the chemical equation. Um, so any of those salts, if you add it in an acidic environment, which is expressed as this here, the H plus, and the salt has uh, CO3 double, mi uh, mi double minus, gives carbonic acid, uh, uh, no, bicarbonate, and then another uh, hydrogen or proton gives carbonic acid, which dissociates eventually in water and CO2. So there is no residues um, in that sense from the carbonate. Calcium carbonate has been used in winemaking for almost a hundred years. It's going back to 1905 or 1911, and it's had been used uh, particularly in the German winemaking forever. Um, now the potassium carbonates, I say, we have two of them: the potassium bicarbonate and potassium carbonate. 
have been only permitted in Canada. I know everybody used it illegally uh, a long time ago, but it only was permitted in the 90s in Canada. We had to fight very hard to have that registered, and I was involved in that. Um, and the same in Europe. If you find a, a wine textbook from 1990, there's no mention of the of the carbonates, of the uh, potassium bicarbonate carbonate. So now sodium sodium carbonates are not permitted, like baking soda, uh, sodium bicarbonate, or washing soda, sodium carbonate are not permitted. I'm surprised because we have other sodium compounds permitted in winemaking, such as cation exchange and uh, sodium metabisulfide that you might use if your wine is cold stable already and you don't want to offset the, the potassium balance you might use in the last second a little bit of a sodium based uh, well, sodium bisulfide and possibly it's not legal but you could also in the same context it wouldn't do the wine more harm than the sodium bi metabisulfide if you would a little bit, uh, uh, last acid adjustment, but 0.2 grams or whatever, but you, you, you would use baking soda, but it's not lethal. It does add sodium to the wine, of course. Um, now, all simple carbonate addition, desification removes the cherry acid only. Any of those. The double salt calcium carbonate desification involves both main acid, grape acid, the tartaric acid plus the malic <coughs> acid. All major acid adjustments are ideally performed on the grape juice. And that's what I want to emphasize over and over again. If you have a vintage year of variety, let's say Riesling, on the Mosul, let's say they are hungry, they quite quite frequently very high acid on reason on the Mosul, which is a very cooler climate. Right? Then you do you do all the coarse acid adjustment before fermentation. You try to put the wine in the approximate structure you want to have it. The fine adjustment you can do on the wine too, but the very rough adjustment you do on the juice acidification and these are the both of them. Do on the juice. You're doing yourself a great favor. Um, now here are the structures of the tartaric acid and it has several isomers because uh, uh, but only the L plus isomer is found in grapes. We, again it has uh, isometric carbon atom. Here is one. Oh sorry, what did I do? Go back. Oh, yeah. yeah, two carbon atoms are isometric here, so you have more isomers. And malic acid basically has uh, one less hydroxide group here. That's a CH2 group there. Both acids have two dissociation constants because you have two acid groups. So one proton dissociates from one side of the acid first and goes in solution and makes that solution acidic. Um, and the second one comes off with more difficulties. That's why it dissociates to a lesser extent. And that's why both acids have two groups, C double bond O or H, which release protons into the medium. One is lost easier and the second one is lost with more difficult. And so we have a, a dissociation constant K, KD1 and uh, we have a dissociation of KD2. So you can see the first one dissociates much to a great extent, the second one. Um, Malic acid is a weaker acid than the tartaric acid because it has one OH group less than the molecule, so it's less electronegative and it doesn't release as much OH 
as easy as patinic acid. Um, the greater the dissociation, the, the stronger the acid, since the strength of an acid is a measure of its ability to release hydrogen ion to solution. And the pK of a weak acid, or the, 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 the pK acid, may be defined to, to pH or pOH, and so the pK is the negative logarithm of the dissociation curve. Um, so here we have that table again. And um, uh, we compare those two, you can see, so therefore the pK1 is at a lower pH for tertiary acid than the P, pK1 for, for, for malic acid. The pH, oh sorry, the, the, the pH for the pK1 of malic acid is at a higher pH. Now be, the midpoint between pK1 and pK2 is calculated as follows. You just add those two numbers together and divide it in half. And that's the mid midpoint between the two pKs. And this is important, I'll come to that in a second. So the midpoint for tartaric acid is 3.6 to 3.7. pH of 3.6, 3.7. And if you plot that, so you can see here, the, this is the undissociated tartaric acid here. H2T. Then it dissociate in uh, HT minus, that's the bitartrate ion. And then the second dissociation would be the uh, T should be double minus, right? That's, yeah. So that's what that is. And here it's the same graph. Um, the midpoint between pK1, here, three, 3 or 4, this is here, to, um, to uh, pK2, which is 4 point, it's not on the graph here, and we should have there. The midpoint is at 367. It's basically adding the two pKs together, dividing it in half. This is not an important thing for you to know. The, potassium bitartrate concentration is highest at the midpoint between the two pKs, the pK1 and pK2. So that means maximum bitartrate precipitation occurs at the midpoint between the two pKs. That's at 3.67. And there has a lot of there's a lot of consequence for you to know to to do. It discusses it here, but we have another slide here. Um, see, as the acids um, dissociate, we have two reactive sites, and so which we use with the carbonate uh, this dissociation. And they, they, for example, they put that calcium carbonate would react with both sides here, both ends of the tartaric acid. So here it shows the formula again. You have tartaric acid in one or two, you have calcium carbonate, the calcium attaches to both ends of the tartaric acid, releases H2H plus and CO2 to double minus. And then of course, that gives carbonic acid, which again dissociates in water into CO2. Um, the reaction is very fast initially when you add the calcium carbonate into the tube of wine. But it's not totally complete, because first of all, not all the hydrogen is dissociated with the key with the second ionization into the liquid. So therefore that takes a while. So the, the complete reaction of the calcium carbonate or the calcium with the will take some time, not long. But for total stabilization, this might you should remember, is about six weeks. And 
the warmer the temperature, the faster it goes. This is opposite to the potassium bicarbonate desification, where the colder it is, the faster it goes. So if you do use calcium carbonate for desification, which most people don't use for standard desification, um, so it takes a while for the wine to uh, stabilize. Meaning that the calcium is used up and uh, precipitate whatever it can be precipitated, and that's it. So one mole of calcium carbonate reacts with one mole of tertiary acid. So here's the equation: calcium carbonate molecular weight weighs about 100 grams per mole. Tertiary acid 150. Easy way to two is 0.6669. So you need 0 0.67 grams of calcium carbonate. To, re to precipitate one gram of tartaric acid. And that's easy to remember. Two thirds of calcium carbonate will precipitate, uh, two thirds of a gram will precipitate one gram of, of tartaric acid. That's quite easy to remember. The, the, the acid goes down, the pH goes up. Um, potassium bicarbonate, this is KHCO3. Now you can see uh, we have again the tartaric acid. Now by adding the potassium bicarbonate here, we um, reacting, like the potassium will attach itself to one end of the tartaric acid, which is, make, is, is potassium bitar, makes, makes potassium bitartrate. Now, since one mole of potassium beta reacts with one mole of tartaric acid again, uh, so the molecular weight of potassium bicarbonate is almost the same as the calcium carbonate, just by a, a tenth of a gram of power or whatever. So again, it gives you this number, which is, again, you need 0.67 grams of potassium bicarbonate to precipitate one gram of tartaric acid. So that's again easy to remember, uh, two thirds of a gram is needed to precipitate one gram of tartaric acid. The, the acid goes down, the pH goes up. Potassium carbonate, I mentioned is not that frequently used because it's much easier with the potassium bicarbonate. But since the potassium carbonate has two React, reactive potassium ions here, so you only need half. This is the gra this is 138.21 grams per mole. So you need only half a mole of the potassium carbonate to precipitate one mole of tartaric acid. So if you divide it through 0.5 moles, so one half mole times 138 grams per mole. Potassium carbonate, tartaric acid, gives point uh, and zero point five for half a mole times point ninety two grams of potassium carbonate. So that's half of point nine two. So for the potassium carbonate, you would need point six point four six grams of calcium uh, uh, potassium uh, carbonate. To reduce to precipitate one gram of tartaric acid, so it's a different ratio, and it's probably not. If you can get potassium bicarbonate, uh, it's a more straightforward uh, uh, doing. Um, so in the both uh, the both the potassium bicarbonate and the potassium carbonate will always reduce the TA and always increase the pH. And I didn't put that in, but you might remember that, if you should remember that. Uh, by 0.67 grams of potassium bicarbonate added, which reduced the tartaric acid by one gram, it, the pH jumps about by one tenth of a unit. So, Let's say from 3.2 to 3.5 uh, 
33. And um, the fact is bring by that precipitation. Now, initially when you add that, you always see a pH jump and a, a, a total acidity going down. For one gram of acid removal, about one pH, uh, one tenth of a pH jump, one gram of acid drop. But as the wine is stored, eventually uh, you see more, slightly more precipitation over time when the, under the storage, if you chill the juice, because for cold stabilization, to make sure there is no crystals in the bottle. So you chill the, the wine. You'll see then in those tanks, on tank wall you see more precipitate. Not a lot, but then, or if you do the desification on the juice before, and then you form the alcohol, the alcohol makes the bitartrate more insoluble. So they'll precipitate more as the alcohol goes up. And chilling the wine for cultivation, or now we come to a point of freezing of the berries during the ice wine making. Um, this is now important to what it comes now. When bitartrate precipitate, there are changes in the medium. The acidity is always lowered. The pH behavior depends on the pH value. And here I want you to really pay attention. At which the bitartrate precipitates. The maximum bitartrate ion concentration, HT minus, happens to be at a midpoint at a pH of 367. Remember, we took the graph and so now here it's important that you really should remember. If this is let's say on a wine in a tank. If the potassium pyridrate precipitate, if still potassium pyridrate precipitate occurs at a lower pH than 3.67, then it lowers the pH because when the pyridrate ion precipitate and is lost, it triggers more H plus release into the medium, into the wine, and therefore dissociation from the tartaric acid which means it lowers the pH. This is very important to, to know if you get bitartrate rate precision further in the tank, if the, the pH of the wine is below 367, you see a, a, a drop in pH, a drop in the acid. Now, if the precipitation occurs at a pH higher than 3.67, then it raised the pH because when the age, uh, uh, the bitartrate is lost to form the precipitate, it triggers more H plus consumption to replenish the bitartrate. So the pH goes up and the TA goes down. So this is not predictable unless you take this in consideration. So if you have a wine with a pH of 3.5, and it's still, because it's getting colder in the winter or whatever, and still precipitates, if it's at a pH of 3.5, the pH goes down, the TA goes down. If the same precipitation occurs at a pH of 3.75, then the TA goes down and the pH goes up. So it's totally different behavior depending on the pH of the wine. Now we come to the double sold. Uh, 15 minutes, we started 10 minutes later. Uh, so the only carbonate which addresses malic acid, also it's a double sold procedure, we call it some carbonate. And in typical tune and white page, it's anywhere from three to three to three seven. Even on turn, you can see some years Riesling chooses with a 287, 29, but it's not usual. It's, uh, but we can see extremes, not real extreme, but. Now the calcium two plus and we react with the tartaric acid. Remember from the single salt tertification, it attaches to the two, two open ends of the tartaric acid. 
but not to the Malagasy and form a calcium, um, it should say calcium Malag, C-A-M, that's, well not, not to the Malag, to form a C-A-M, that's what it should say here. Yeah. It's a little bit confusing, the, the, the sentence. Uh, okay, so calcium tartrate, we know, we have discussed already. So the potassium, uh, the calcium 2 plus cannot bind to the malic acid because the PK, PK1 is less or is higher and the PK2. Um, and so the tartaric acid is competitively outstripping the malic acid for the reaction. So at the wine pH, at that pH of regular wine pH, no malic acid will grab onto the calcium 2 plus. So what we need to do is, and here comes the secret of the, or the, the thing of the double solidification. What we need to do is to know where, what, at what pH is malic acid willing to react with the calcium carbonate. And this is at a pH greater than 4.5. So now the question is, how can I get there? You cannot potassium hydroxide legally to the wine to get the pH up there. So you have to use what you have. And since you use the calcium carbonate, you have to use the calcium carbonate to increase the pH of the wine. But you can't use that much calcium carbonate to increase the pH of all the wine because you end up with no acid then. So therefore you have to separate off a portion of the wine or the juice, preferable juice. So, so we can use calcium carbonate, uh, repeating, to raise the pH to make the precipitation happen. Only a fraction of the juice or the wine can be used for that. If this fraction is separated and treated with calcium carbonate, the pH is then, ra then raised on its partial volume to between 4.5 and 6.5 for the calcium carbonate depending on the amount of calcium carbonate being, being used. Now, that amount of calcium carbonate being used is determined by how much you want to reduce the acidity. So that's why it's a range from 4.5 to 6.5. If you only want to reduce, let's say if you have an acid in wine of 15 grams per liter, uh, and you only want to reduce it to, let's say an ice wine juice, to 13. And there's a lot of malic acid, and we'll come to that, because in H1 choose a lot of malic acid. Uh, then you don't need that much calcium carbonate. So then the volume of the separated juice will be less. And as the reaction proceeds, the pH goes down again. So, so the higher the pH, then some of the malic ion will also react with the calcium carbonate, with the calcium 2 plus. But, since the calcium still reacts with tartaric acid, it does not react exclusively with malic acid at that higher pH. It's just that the, the, the malic ion at that higher pH will be willing to react with a bit of the, of the calcium. But the greatest competitor still will be the, the, the tartaric ion. <coughs> So this double soap was first, first mentioned in 1891 by a Frenchman, actually, Ordonneau, and later recognized by Münz in Germany in 1960-61, that this double salt offered an opportunity to precipitate some malic acid besides tartaric acid, not exclusive malic, just some of it. In 1963, Kilhaven, Würdig refined this process and was modified again in 1988 by Würdig 
Today, this process is recommended only for acids which are very high, or higher than 11 grams, otherwise don't bother. And if those tables, we go to the calculation, but you'll see, you don't even need to calculate it because you get the tables from the suppliers and how much calcium you need and how much, and so on. Now, I personally know, knew Dr. Würdig. I stayed at his house a few times in three on the Mosul. And so that's why he taught me how the double salt worked a long time ago. So now the limit there are limitations. The tartaric acid portion of the total acid must always be greater than fifty percent of the total acid or titoblast. Now Debbie you, you can tell me it's probably a great limitation to smaller winers who don't have the means to determine how much tartaric acid is in the, in the grape juice. You can determine what what instrument, what do you need for that? Uh, uh, you need HPLC. To you need to HPLC. Try. But you can determine indirectly, which could use if you use a malic enzyme kit. So you take it, you determine the malic acid, the, subtract it from the TA, and then it gives you some idea what the tartaric acid is. Uh, so again, we have mentioned that it's a strong acid. In reality, based on their percentage present, only between 30 and 50% of the precipitate form is due to the calcium malate. I say they both react, and the tartaric acid still has a stronger affinity to the calcium, so it is still more, even at a pH of 5.5 five, or 5, still more calcium tartrate precipitated but some cuts in Mali. Um, now then, then, this is a worker from California, Munto, Munto well, I don't know how to pronounce it, showed the malic acid would have to be twice the arteric acid level to produce actually a 50-50 ratio between the two acids in the precipitate, or between the two salts in the precipitate. A more limitation. Today, some special purity calcium carbonate salts available, which are often doped with, should that be double P or not? Is that correct? <coughs> doping, doping is double P or one single P? One. It's okay, okay, sorry. English is not my language. <laughs> uh, so they, they, they see those calcium carbonate with, one percent of the crystals and the act as seeds when you add it so it makes it easier for the calcium and uh, the malic acid and tartaric acid to make the double salt. Then several investigators um, report less malic, malic removal and the one-to-one -one ratio removal could only if the initial malic acid was uh, again twice the tartaric acid level which can happen in ice wine. Um, Dr. Wurick told me he had one time on the Mosul a Riesling ice wine with, where the tea was 27 grams per liter and he had to three times deacidified. He had to do it in stages. Um, okay, so there was some, um, so this is the way how it would look like at a pH form between 4.5 and 6.5. See, uh oh. That should say that should say CH two here. Yeah. So that's a low typo. The malic acid is uh, is CH on the third carbon atom is CH two, not COH. So here it's correct. You can see the molecular form here is correct written. So you have a double salt that the calcium attaches to to both acids. Two molecules of calcium attached to one. Um, like this is ideal condition. That looks like it's a 50-50 ratio, but it isn't. It's normally less uh, calcium, uh, malic acid. So the stoichiometry is still the same. You need 0.67 grams per liter of calcium carbonate to remove one gram of TA. 
and here are the formula for the calcium carbonate double salt. This is the interior equal molar quantities of tertiary malic acid are removed in practice, however, more tertiary acid is removed. I just mentioned that. More tertiary acid with malic in must and wine. Calcium tartrate can be received a single salt in addition to being involved in double salt precipitation. Um, so we are, we are repeating one of the things we have said before. Um, so two moles of acid react with two moles of calcium carbon, therefore the one-to-one -one molar relationship. Um, now here is the process, and this is the key thing. If you do a double salt certification, first of all, I gave you the tables, and I gave you the drawings, what I'm showing to you now here. See, you weigh out the calcium carbonate, which you can calculate when we get to that, and you put it in a container, and then you add the calculated volume, oil from the table, with a stirrer, and constantly stir it, the CO2 always escapes right away. So, that's the second step. So you add that, but stirring, stirring, stirring. That takes about 20 minutes. And then you let it settle out until everything has reacted. You wait till there's no more foaming or gas escaping. And then you can use, you can transfer the deacified portion of the juice, they should have shown that a little bit here. You can either fill, you should fill the it over. For big winery operation nowadays, they might not have a blade and frame filter, they might even have a cross full for filter. Let's say if a very large winery has to do that, use that. And then the fourth step is of course to mix it back together with the leftover volume of the wine. The, as I said, the key point is that you weigh out the calcium carbonate, add it to the container, the rea reaction container first, and then you add the juice to it, so that at any given time, the the calcium carbonate is in surplus and the pH, pH always stays high. So what do you need to know is the total volume of the wine treated. You need to know the total acidity. Um, you need to the desired acid. So the titrable acidity minus the desired acid, let's say if the TA is 13 grams per liter and you want 9 grams per liter, then the, the, you want to deacidify by 4 grams per liter. And you need to know the part, part volume. Um, and the, you calculate that here. So the, you can, but I'm sure everybody would be using the table. So, uh, so that's the way, so the, the tangible acidity minus the desired acid times the calcium carbonate times the total volume gives you a percentage which is the, gives you the partial volume then. And here are those, uh, uh, there's two formulas, the one is for choose, it has a correction factor here, and the other one is for wine. So, but I'm just bringing to you, if you use the correction factor, if you don't use the correction factor, so let's say <coughs> this formula to reduce the acid by, how much is it, uh, 6.9 grams per liter, and 1,300 liters of, of, we're not defining here juice or wine right now. It gives you a, it, it, then it gives you, a, a, it's 45% of the total volume you need to use, so it's 590 liters, and, but if you correct it, for the juice, it would be actually 680 liters, and that's why those correction factors are there. But in the formulas, I have all the formulas, it's in there. So the correction factor is there, that the, if you use the correction factor, you actually need a little bit more volume on juice and wine. 
So if not, then some leftover calcium carbonate will go over into the big tank and then it will only react with the the worst thing that can happen, it'll take out only more tartaric acid. But the correction factor is important, it's there that you really can calculate the right volume you still need, exactly need. So, so don't use double salt where if you, uh, for any acid less than 10.5. If you look at the tables, I think they only start even at 11 grams per liter. Um, and only only liquid with the acid is above 11. And I would say substantially above 11 grams per liter. The table start with 11 grams, so. So, uh, if however, this is now important to know. If the tartaric acid, and most people don't have a HPLC, yeah, but you can calculate from, with a, if you have an enzyme kit for malic acid, you can get some idea what the tertiary acid is. substantially or it's less than malic acid, uh, which can happen in extreme years. Let's say the total acid or tetra is 19 grams per liter and the malic acid is 12. Then the tertiary acid should be added before the double salt certificate. And the reason is, let's say if one acid is the tartaric is that high, no, the malic is that high, and the tartaric is here. If you do the double salt certification, you don't get the proper reaction. So you would add tartaric acid, so if the malic is higher than the tartaric portion, then you make them e e equal or the tartaric acid higher. And then you take the higher, artificially increased acid down with the double salt again. And you can do that two or three times to get the malic acid to the level you want it. And this is what Dr. Whitty told me that time, with the reason acid was, was total acid title was 27 grams per liter. And he had to, and this is called malitex process. So wood. Um, now in ice one, I'll be done in two minutes. In ice wine, you can have real surprises. For example, this year, I've seen data from the ice wine picking the first, the reason of when the earlier days of January, that actually the total acid, the type of acid in the ice wine juice was 5.55 grams per liter, and the pH was 322. So what are you gonna do then? You can't add more, you can't add easy three grams per liter of tartaric acid to bring it to 8.5 or 9, because the pH is going to drop to three or lower. So therefore, um, you could use one of those earlier techniques we discussed. So you can have those crazy things on ice wine. And one of the reasons is that when the, the berries freeze, there's potassium bidactrate in solution at regular temperature. Now it suddenly goes down to minus 10. So a lot of potassium bidactrate precipitates out in the berry and it's lost for good. So when you press the grapes in the frozen state, you have lost a lot of tartaric acid. And that's one of the reasons why when people make the second pressing trying to make it in the late harvest, it always tastes lousy because it doesn't have it doesn't have much tartaric acid left there. All you get is, and first of all, once potassium bitartrate precipitated in the dairy, it's not easy it's going to re-dissolve again. It's very hard to dissolve. Um, so, for example, this can happen because when you freeze the grapes, let's say regular, before the grapes have 20 bricks, then you freeze it at minus 10, suddenly they have, when they press it frozen, 40 bricks. That's typical is that. At minus 10, you half the volume about, you double the malic acid, or you um, half the TA, not quite, 
but tartaric acid or more. But malic acid is always recovered. Malic acid does not precipitate in the berry. So your malic portion in the grape juice in Iceland is pretty much the same as it was before freezing. But the tartaric acid can, the content is much lower. So um, another thing you might need to know, what we have seen, Debbie, we have worked together with Debbie a year, few years back, We've done like 280 samples. It, at a typical freezing at minus 10, minus 10 to minus 11, the malic acid, uh, the, uh, malic acid uh, is recovered from the initial juice, but at half the volume. So therefore, typical malic acid content in grape juice, if you press the grapes un unfrozen, you would have, let's say, two grams per liter, they have frozen at four grams per liter. So that you have real funny situations in ice wine making because of that situation that a lot of cream of tata precipitates in the frozen berry and it's not recovered. So here's a table uh, when we worked together on that. Uh, uh, that's about five years ago. So you, there were a lot of samples we, we did. Uh, what David did, I, we only supplied the samples from, from the settling tank. So, uh, so malic acid usually very dominant in ice wine juices. Uh, many of you, or most of you, probably never have really looked into that, how the malic acid would, would be compared in ice wine juice, but it's high percentage wise. Now, again, and here comes that if the pH of the berry juice was below 3.67, then that's the thing what I'm trying to tell this year. The acid dropped to 5.55 and the pH dropped to 3.22. So the pH in the berry was below 3.67, probably somewhere 3.35 or 3.40. So then you can get juice, which is very low TA, but also very low pH. Uh, so it is sometimes said that the TA in hydrogen juice is actually lower than the original juice before freezing. Although you think it should be more because of the freezing, you have to choose, you, you, put, you, you double the acid, but the tartrate, bitartrate uh, portion from the tartaric acid, the portion is left behind as bitartrate in the berry. So those that can, um, so the acid additions or desification in Iceland juice can be tricky because you really got to think it through. That's it. Thank you. because the pH does not go up because the calcium carbonate has to be in surplus in excess at any given minute or instant or any given second to the juice above 4.5. So that's why you add the powder first and then you add, you start slowly and you stir it. So at the beginning the pH maybe jumps to 3.638 right away and then as you add more and more, you measure volume, calculate the volume from the table. Then the pH slowly drops, but the calculations of the tables are made in such a way the pH will never go down, even after all everything is together, never go drop below 4.5.
and that's the secret. You can't add the calcium carbonate to the measured juice because you will have the pH of 365. And no malic acid will come out. The only react with the tartaric acid. So it's, you really only need to do the, the double stove dedication when you have extreme uh, situations for, for acidity. But it can happen in ice wine making because a lot of tartaric acid is lost in the in the berry. And if you do a double salt, then for decreasing the malic acid, then you definitely will do the malic explosive to bring up the tartaric acid portion, and then you do the acidification. Again, double salt measured out. Put the Carlton County first in the mixing container and then you add solar energy. That at any given time, the pH, any given time, it remains above 4.5. Any other question? Well, uh, please join me again in thanking Carl for an okay. exciting uh, lecture today on DSM. Topic is, does a wine's name influence consumer taste perception?